from Channel 4, the local station. This is special coverage as Jacksonville remembers former mayor Jake Godbold, a celebration of his life and legacy. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Wall with Kent Justice bringing you our special coverage of the celebration of life, as we mentioned, of former mayor Jake Godbold. I, I think that what is so um, poignant about what we're experiencing here this morning is, as you can hear behind us, the Beach Boys are yeah, playing. Right. There's a jazz <laughs> band that's getting ready to come into the exhibition hall. This is truly about the celebration of this former mayor's life. Yeah, uh, Jake Godbold known for many things, including his enthusiasm and that it was contagious. So you're looking right there at the Let It Ride brass band uh, just a moment ago. They are going to be marching in in a moment uh, in kind of a processional here as the family comes in. And uh, it, it's, it's really an incredible event, gentlemen. In fact, you're looking live right now uh, specifically at those who were gathered here. You saw before yeah. Sheriff Mike Williams with his wife. And that is the jazz band, of course, that Kent was referring. This was something that was very important to Mayor Godbold. When the jazz festival, when he brought it here to the city, he wanted to start that festival just like New Orleans style. And this is how now his celebration of life is beginning as a result. This whole celebration of life really follows his wishes, something that he wanted. He wanted to be uh, celebrated in a way that showed what was important to him because it was a family for certain. It was the communities throughout Duval County that he plugged himself into. And of course, he came from a community and some tough circumstances having grown up during the Depression. Yeah, humble means certainly always prided himself on the fact that he grew up, um, you know, with, with basically the working poor, grew up in a, in a, in a public housing in Brentwood, uh, always said that it was that upbringing that led him to make all the decisions that he did as mayor. This was a man who sold boiled peanuts as a child, uh, ha had a newspaper route. In fact, it was the money from that newspaper route that he used to buy his family's first car. Yeah, it's interesting. Earlier, I was thinking, boy, it's, it's kind of bittersweet because you're sad that this wonderful man is gone. And then it's impossible seeing this to be sad because it really is about celebrating. He lived a full life, and as we talked about right to the very end, he was uh, passionate about his city. Let's listen to the Let It Ride brass band for just a moment. led by Martha uh, Barrett, who was a, a school board member, certainly for many years, worked for Mayor Godbull as his aide and within his campaign. Now I'm told that Bo will be adopted by Alberta Hips, by the way, former city council president. So some applause here for this processional. Uh, when the Saints go marching in, there's going to be more music throughout this. Uh, and as you probably know, our good friend Tom Wills is the master of ceremonies as this uh, celebration of life goes on today. Let's listen.
Good morning. And welcome to all of you, loved ones, friends, and admirers of the man most of us knew just very simply as Jake, former Mayor Jake Godbold. First and foremost to his family, while we know you are still grieving, we know you are also proud of the legacy left by your dad, granddad, brother, loved one. We are here today to celebrate, and he would want me to emphasize the word celebrate, a life of legendary proportions. A giant who walked among us as one of us who would say today that each person here is as important and valuable as any other person in this room. Jake would also want us to be joyful and to use this time to remember his spirit and how he changed the city that he loved so much. I believe he would want us to leave here with smiles on our faces, joy in our hearts, and with a purpose to make Jacksonville a better place for everyone. When Mayor Godbold left office in 1987, the Jacksonville Journal wrote this in an editorial under the headline, Godbold lifted the city's spirit and listened to the people. The man in the city and its people did well together during the Godbold years. How do we apportion the credit? Let the historians figure that out. Meanwhile, the people of Jacksonville express their opinion in a telling way. When they see Godbold, they smile and they shout, Hi, Jake! And Jake beams and waves back. So let's get started. Will you all please stand up? Now turn to your neighbors and say it loud and clear. Hi, Jake! Hi, Jake! Hi, Jake. Hi, Jake. One more time, loud and clear so your neighbor can hear it. Hi, Jake! Well done, you're a very well-behaved crowd. Thank you, you may be seated. Some of us were blessed enough to know him well, and I'm sure there are perhaps some people here today who never met the man and yet still feel drawn to him. We all loved him. With Jake, you saw what you saw is what you got. You never had to question what he was thinking, what he believed, or what he wanted to do because he told you. Up until the last days of his life, Jake was standing up, speaking out, and changing history in our city. If we did not give him a speaking part in this celebration of his life, Jake would come back and haunt Mike Tolbert. So we're going to hear from the man himself right now. Last November, when the sale of JEA was being debated, Jake made his voice heard and made it clear to city council members at a fact-finding workshop chaired by Councilman Michael Boylan that he would not be silent on this subject. And it's a good recommendation today. Now, I'll Mr. Chairman, I sat here with my ass a long time to say that, and I'm not coming back again. But I was in your district with a new group of people, and I've never seen a more upset people in any meeting I went to. I was out there at 930 at night. A guy 87 years old ought not have to be out there at night. I don't like being so frank. I don't like being against the mayor. I was with the lady. I was with Missouri. I was with Peyton. I enjoyed being with you, and I want to be with you, and I want to make this team and this city the greatest city there is. Feel free to applaud. As it says on the cover of the book, Jake, he was the last Southern populist mayor who transformed Jacksonville from a sleepy city 
with an inferiority complex into a dynamic metropolis with a can-do attitude. He understood that his first priority was to convince the people of Jacksonville that his city, our city, was a great city. If he didn't change attitudes here, none of the things he wanted to accomplish would get done. He wanted to stand in the middle of town and shout, George Edmondson, I'm paraphrasing here, two bits, four bits, six bits a dollar, all for Jacksonville, stand up and holler. And have 500,000 people stand up with him and yell at the top of their lungs. He wanted to create a spirit that caused us to say, yep, Jacksonville really is a great place. If Jake's vision was to get an NFL team, he inspired us to believe and help make it happen. When he said we need more cranes in downtown and need to create jobs, he formed partnerships with the people who could make that happen. When he wanted to bring attention to the forgotten village of Mayport, he created a jazz festival that introduced thousands to the community and caused all of Northeast Florida to dance in delight. And 40 years later, we're still dancing. When he wanted to bring seniors and African Americans into the mainstream of Jacksonville life, he just did it. You can apply that vision, energy, leadership, and the ability to unite Jacksonville to get so many things done. Metropolitan Park, South Bank Riverwalk, Jacksonville Landing, Mayo Clinic, J. Turner Butler Boulevard, the Florida Theater, saving Union Terminal and turning it into this convention center, $1 billion in downtown redevelopment. He was proud of these accomplishments, but he took a special joy in things like four regional libraries, seven community centers, seven swimming pools, six miles of sewer lines each year, the mayor's older buddies, a minority set-aside program, the bulls, the T-men, and so much more. So today, we are here to celebrate Jake for those achievements and so many others. Most of all, we're here to remember and rejoice in the way Jake brought us all together and showed us through his leadership that we could do much more than we ever dreamed. And he inspired us in his spirit that caused us to love Jacksonville almost as much as he did. Thank you, Tom. It is, uh, it is hard to imagine Jacksonville, Florida without Jake Godbold. And we've all come to know him in different ways and in different times. And uh, I had the privilege of being the first, the last, and the only intern uh, in Godbold's administration back in 1985. Uh, Martha Barrett was actually technically my boss, I guess. And that's where I met Betty Hels Helsendorf. Uh, she expanded my vocabulary. <laughs> but you know, when I first went there, my early impressions were not particularly positive. It seemed like a chaotic environment. Um, the mayor was under enormous stress, um, but it quickly became obvious to me that I was, had a front row seat in experiencing uh, a leader that was extraordinary, uh, did extraordinary things in extraordinary ways uh, that left an impact uh, that we all enjoy each day. When I think back on Jake, I, there, there are th three themes that really come to mind. One was his passion. It was impossible to be in a room with Jake and not be infected by his enthusiasm, about his excitement, about his belief in our city. And that passion was magnetic. It would bring people to him. It would bring people to the cause. It would draw people uh, to the movement, whatever that issue of the day was. People wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to hear where he was taking us and, and wanted to know how they could be a part of that, that vision. 
And it was energizing. I mean, you, you, you couldn't be with him without feeling mobilized uh, to want to help and to want to contribute and to be a part of the story. Jake's also inclusive. And I, I think the theme of inclusivity, which we have, have our time seeing in a lot of our politics today, is probably one of the qualities I've most admired and tried most to emulate. Whenever our community had an issue or a challenge, Jake opened the doors. He wanted the people to come in and share their opinions. In fact, at times he took the hinge off the door just to send a message uh, that we, we moved this city forward by, by, by working together and, and hearing even dissenting opinions about how we move forward. It was amazing to watch. When, when Jake was elected, he didn't have the support of the Chamber of Commerce. He didn't have the support of some of our uh, cultural organizations and art institutions. Um, but those are the first groups he reached out to. And, and after 10 years of service, these folks were not only um, involved, but they were advocates of his and friends of his. And these friendships carried through time. It didn't matter your, your station in life. It didn't matter your income, your education. Jake worked hard to bring everybody to the table. And, and that is how I think he was able to mobilize our community for so many impressive projects uh, in a job that is difficult to do. And I think the other theme is, is Jake's loyalty. Jake was extraordinarily loyal. Um, he was loyal to his family, Ben, Matilda, Morgan, his brother, Lynn, his sister, Charlene, and Faye, Jean, his wife, who he, he adored. Loyal to the friends that served with him to help him get elected. Loyal to the folks that helped him govern. Uh, and this loyalty we observe is a two-way street. And, and looking around this room, so many folks are here uh, out of deep loyalty to Jake. And I know for that, he is extraordinarily grateful. It is hard to imagine Jacksonville without Jake Godbold. I, I can't imagine our political commentary without his perspective, without his energy, without his color. Uh, he kept things exciting. He told us the truth when it wasn't comfortable. He was gave us the unvarnished truth. He uh, had no trouble saying what many people are often thinking, but had the courage to say it, was never intimidated, never threatened. He used the power of our strong mayor form of government to bring people together, which is extraordinary, which is extraordinary in this day and age. I'm gonna miss Jake. We're, we're losing a friend. We're losing a public servant. To Jake, we just say, job well done. You will be missed, my friend. Godspeed. Good morning. To the members on the dais, to all the people out in the audience, I pondered for weeks what would I say if I had to speak about Jake. And I guess what comes to my mind is that he was my teacher. Everything I know about politics, I learned it from Jake. So if I'm a bad politician, Y'all know where it comes from. <laughs> At that comment <laughs> that John made, I learned that language from Jake. <laughs> he was my mentor. He always said to me, Betty, you're green as a pool table and twice as square. You don't know nothing about politics. So let me sit down and tell you. I met him in 1975. I went to work as an aide to Mayor Tanzler. And the city of Jacksonville was experiencing a drawdown on their federal funds. We had to put together an affirmative action plan, have it in Washington, D.C., accept it, and it had to be there in six months. Jake chaired the council committee because it had to be passed by city council. He ushered that plan through. He wouldn't go to Washington with us, and I learned later he didn't like to fly. But when I came back, I rushed to his office to tell him they accepted the plan, we're not gonna lose any federal funds. And he looked at me and said, you didn't think we would, did you? 
He said, I knew when you left here they were going to accept that plan. He was so confident in himself. He was so comfortable in his skin. I know people talk about all the things he did, all the buildings and the plans and everything, but Jake Godbo, the Jake Godbo I knew, he was an ordinary man, just like any other father, any other working class person, but he did extraordinary things. He made this city what it is. And the way he did it was to make each and every one of us like ourselves. He said, if you don't like you, you're not gonna make anybody else like your city. If you don't like this city, Betty, then you ought to move. But if you like this city, you first have to like yourself. He had two families. He had his family, he loved Ben, he called him Big Ben, and he had Jacksonville. Those were his two families. And he was offended if anybody attempted to do anything to interfere with those families. I knew the man. I also knew the mayor. But I liked the man, and I loved the mayor. He would stop at my office every morning. For some reason, Don and Martha then put me at the back by the elevator. I think that was a message. So Jake would always come to my office when he got off the elevator, and we would sit and talk. I would have coffee, he would have a Coke. And we talked about things other than Jacksonville. And that's how I got to know him, and to know his heart, and to know his desires, and to know what he wanted for this city. When we went to Baltimore with him and he met Mayor Schaefer, he said, I can do that and do it better. And he did. He went from a young man in Brentwood collecting golf balls on the golf course to sitting on the 14th floor of City Hall, ushering in a billion dollar decade. That was Mayor Jake Gotbo. Of course he's going to be missed. Of course this city is going to miss him. But any tribute we make to him, it would be to love yourself and to love others just as you love yourself. Because that's the only way you're going to make a great city. Jake always said, you can put all the buildings and all the roads and all the schools, but if you don't have people, you don't have a city. The city is the people. He said, better you can have a city in the fields over at Amundsen Airport if you got people. And you cannot have a city if you have the tallest buildings in the world and nobody's in them. So I'm going to miss him because he was my friend. I'm going to miss him because I cared about him. I'm going to miss him because he cared about me. He changed me. He made me able to accept people that I never would have accepted to do things that I never thought I could do. And as a result of that, I'm here. And as a result of that, you are there. Because he didn't do festival shopping. He didn't do all those things for himself. He did them for you. He did them for the city of Jacksonville. And I thank him. And I know that wherever he is, He's going to keep doing it. Thank you. Louis Armstrong said about this song, 
It's about what the world could be if we choose to make it this way. Sweepy Bob. 
Uh, as a Louisiana boy and uh, jazz and all that stuff, I appreciate that and I understand where you're coming from on that. <laughs> Let me first begin by saying I am honored to have been selected by Jake to speak at his memorial service. When I received the call stating that Jake had requested that I be a part of the celebration of life, I was overwhelmed. But more importantly than that, I have been honored to know Jake. Jake was a man who was not afraid to embrace diversity. Jake Godbold, as mayor, embraced inclusion of African Americans in this city. He appointed me as the first African American to serve on the Port Authority. But it didn't just stop with me. He promoted inclusion throughout his administration, board appointments, and policies. Jake loved this city. And all the people of our community. His diligent and courageous efforts to bring about a better condition in this city have been eminently successful. It is because of men like Jay Godbolt that have pro prospered, and I cannot let pass the opportunity to express my sincere appreciation of his achievements. Always simply known as Jake, I will always remember Jake Godbold as mayor, my friend, and as a fighter for change, he only wanted people to do the right thing. This is my testimonial to a good, sincere, hardworking mayor. I'm not a politician, so I don't have any other things. So I'll let, let you politicians talk the rest of the life. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Just for, for clarification, I'm not a politician. <laughs> I was honored also to be asked to give a few brief remarks for my friend and my business associate, the legendary Jake Godbold. I probably knew him longer than anybody up here on this stage. 54 years ago, I met Jake. Just out of the Army, I became a debit agent for Independent Life in an office where one of the staff managers was Jake Godbold. On Fridays, we all had to report to the office on the corner of Bay and Laura, and often Jake would give a motivational speech. You know he loved to speak, right? And often, we would miss lunch before Jake finished. But he was a good motivator with all of that energy he had. When he ran for city council the first time, he would have all the younger members of our office, myself included, knocking on doors, handing out Jake literature all over the north side. I was there for his first public vision. He won the election, and we were all assembled to celebrate at the Pearl Street Women's Club. Jake was on his fifth Coca-Cola when he started talking about one day being mayor. And we all laughed. It's Jake, you just got elected to city council. Don't get carried away. <laughs> we worked together for three years, selling insurance and promoting Jake's political interest. Jake was a visionary. Remember when he saw a ditch on that chamber trip to San Antonio? and envisioned the river walk on the mighty St. John's River. Of course, his big vision was getting an NFL team, 
and we all thought that was kind of strange also. The difference with Jake, he not only had the vision, but he also had the energy to make the vision a reality. Perhaps a vision without the energy is just an illusion. We've always joked that our family were the only people in Ortega in the business community that voted for Jake when he ran for mayor. But the first thing he did after the election was to reach out to the business community and the chamber. Imagine that happening today. I think his greatest legacy is that he brought the whole community together. Jake was a big tent guy. We have rarely experienced that before or since. The other great trait, trait of Jake Godbowl was his passion for this city. That was his driving force, in my opinion. And we all benefited big time from his vision, his energy, and his passion. He was a big part of our lives. Thanks, Jake. I interrupt this part of our program with breaking news. I can now reveal publicly that Jake Godbold and I had an almost 45-year-long friendship. Yes, a reporter and a politician. It was more than a friendship. It was actually a love affair. It was based on two things. He loved to talk to me. I love to listen to him. I admit he was not faithful to me in our love affair. He was a polygamist, since I know many of you had the same love affair with him. There was one distinction about our friendship, however. I brought a TV camera and a Channel 4 news photographer to many of the rendezvous that Jake and I had so we could share our conversations with the Channel 4 viewing public. You've heard him. 
You know how compelling he was when he spoke. His enthusiasm, his passion, his power of persuasion. Of course, what made him such a great talker is he was such a great doer. You might say he took the bold in God bold and put it in bold new city of the South. I never had to bring very many questions to our interviews. He gave me answers without me doing much asking. But I did have to urge him sometimes to hold off telling us what he had on his mind until after we got the camera turned on. Sometimes the most memorable things that he had to say, he said right at the very beginning, and I didn't want the camera to miss them. There was one other challenge with our interviews. Did any of you ever notice, pay close enough attention to how Jake could start a new sentence without actually finishing the old one first? <laughs> or did he just do that for the TV camera? It made editing his interviews difficult. Could it have been that he didn't want to be edited, but wanted everything that he had to say to be heard? Before I sit back down, I'd like to share with you the first interview I remember with Jake and what would have been our last. Not long after he became mayor, I went to Washington, or he went to Washington, seeking funding from the new Reagan administration for what was then called the People Mover here in Jacksonville. It's right outside. Channel 4 sent me along to cover the mayor's trip. He had a meeting scheduled with the president's prominent and somewhat controversial White House budget director, David Stockman. Before the meeting, I was interviewing the mayor, who kept referring to David Stockman as David Stockton, with a T instead of an M, as in the long ago Jacksonville real estate firm Stockton Watley Davin. The mayor did have a tendency to sometimes come up with his own personal mispronunciation of names. Ben just said, here, here. <laughs> it, it was actually part of his charm. I did not think it was my place as the reporter to correct him. I presumed that Martha or Don McClure would do that. Well, the White House meeting was held and I never did learn what Mayor Godbold called David Stockman. For all I know, he called him Dave and had Dave call him Jake. What I do know is that Mayor Godbold got the money for the people mover. What a fitting it name, what a fitting name it was for that project back then, when you think about it. Because through his entire public life, as so many others have said, as Betty said so eloquently, Jake was for people. I really can't think of anyone I've ever met who was more devoted to people and their lives as Jake was. And even though he was a politician who loved crowds, think of his quail roast at Christmas time, he could be just as devoted to people one person at a time. And that brings me to my last conversation with him. A Channel 4 viewer named Victoria, had reached out to me and asked if I could arrange for Mayor Godbold to autograph. Can you see it? This picture of the landing in its glory days. I said, of course, but I asked her, wouldn't she like to meet him in person and have him sign her picture? Because I know he would be more than willing and he would enjoy meeting and hearing her stories about her happy days at the landing. Victoria was thrilled. We made a date. We were all going to meet downtown near the almost demolished landing. Channel 4 would send a news photographer and we would make the visit between Jake and Victoria, a positively Jack story. At the last minute, Jake had to cancel. He told me he was, just wasn't feeling well, but he hoped we could reschedule the following week. 
The Sunday before he passed away, he and I talked on the phone. He told me he was doing better, and he would call me during the week to reschedule with Victoria. The call never came. Instead, the call came into the newsroom that Jake was gone. Sometime later that day, I contacted Victoria to make sure she'd heard the news, and of course she had. She told me as far as she is concerned, Mayor Godbold's signature is now in her heart. This is the frame picture that hangs in her house. As far as she and I are concerned, it is signed in Jake's spirit. Thank you for listening. God bless the Godbolts. If you want to know where I'm going, where I'm going soon, if anybody asks you. Take the pain, the heartaches they bring, the comfort sin knowing I'll soon be gone. As God gives me grace, I'll run this race until I see my.
that was quite wonderful. Good morning, all. Previous speakers have spoken eloquently and accurately as to Jake's many big accomplishments. The football team, the Florida theater, the billion dollar decade. But I was privileged to have small personal conversations with him. But those conversations were starter kits, microcosms of larger efforts and large and most successful contributions to our community and to his legacy. When he was first elected to mayor, I was not his supporter. I had uh, vigorously supported his opponent. But I was chairman of the Chamber of Commerce and incumbent upon us was to visit the new mayor, to call upon him and offer our congratulations and gestures going forward. As we approached the 14th floor, I wondered if he was going to throw me out the window or out the door. And of course he didn't either. He embraced us, reached out to us, and began a conversation, a dialogue, between his administration and the business community, one which has lasted certainly throughout his administration, but many, many years following his tenure as mayor. Second occasion, the chamber and the mayor's office arranged a trip to Baltimore to see what had been accomplished there and to learn from our experiences visiting other cities and speaking to their leaders. And indeed, the mayor was much moved and much influenced by that first trip to Baltimore and came back with the idea based upon seeing Baltimore's inner harbor and the life and energy that it possessed and the Jacksonville Landing and much of the North Bank's improvement were inspired by that trip to Baltimore. It also led to what is today still a very thriving and important program, and that is the annual leadership trips, which are led by the Chamber of Commerce and the Mayor's Office and participated with many, many people, elected officials, business leaders, and others on an annual visit to other cities to see and to learn and bring back the best of all practices and undertakings to Jacksonville. The initial trip again was to Baltimore, but our second trip was to San Antonio. And we indeed had walking tours and probably a meal or two on the waterfront of a very small, about the size of this aisle, downtown riverfront with plazas continuing on both sides of the water. And Jake said to himself and to us, gosh, if San Antonio can do this with that little bitty ditch, think what we can do with the St. John's River. <laughs> and indeed, we returned from San Antonio and it wasn't much longer that he introduced legislation and funding for the South Bank River Walk which again today stands as a tribute, a memory, a legacy, Jake Godbold. The final such personal encounter that I remember, it was the mid 70s and Shep Bryan and I, Shep was head of the Arts Assembly, which is now the Cultural Council. And the city as it has continued to do funded the so-called cultural grants which went to our important cultural institutions throughout the community. And Shep and I went to the mayor and said, Mayor, the city funding of the Arts Assembly has been stuck at $500,000 for several years. Can you help us get it back up to an appropriate level? About 30 days later, I got a call from the Cultural Council, Arts Assembly, and told me 
that the cultural grant from the city would now be $800,000. So that was the type of thing that Jake took an interest in. Everything from waterfront development to downtown development to arts and culture. And we were very fortunate to have such an tra energetic, transformational figure as mayor of our community during those important and critical days, the decade, if you will, of the 1980s. The decade of the 80s will live in our memory and we will long enjoy and appreciate what Jake Godball did for us during that decade. I certainly shall, and I hope all of you do too. Thank you. Well, I discovered just a few minutes ago that there was something that Jake and I had in common that I didn't realize. Preston vigorously supported my opponent when I ran for mayor as well. And Jake, this has been, and we also became good friends and good supporters too. Jake was a regular guy, and many people have used the same word that I was going to use. He was an extraordinary guy at the same time. I'm going to pass on two quick stories that he told me that really endeared me to the regular guy aspect uh, of Jake Godbold. He served in Korea, which we saw in the obituary, but he told me how he got to Korea. And for this story, you need to know, as Betty mentioned, um, uh, Jake gets motion sick. He hates to fly. He loves to fish, but in lakes and in the rivers and creeks, but not, not offshore. So Jake got to Korea by troop ship. He said it took him one month. He was seasick the entire month. He said he threw up nonstop. He said it got so bad that he tied himself to a rail on the top deck through the rain and the night and those sorts of things. He said he didn't eat for 30 days. I said, Jake, you can't live without eating for 30 days. He said, I lost 30 pounds in those 30 days. I didn't eat a thing. The second time he told me the story, the trip was two months and he'd lost 60 pounds. <laughs> Now, the point to the story was actually this, that he said that for the year he was in Korea, he spent every single day trying to figure out how to get back to Jacksonville via dry land. <laughs> and I said, Jake, you can't get to Jacksonville from Korea by dry land. And he said, well, I was going to try to figure out a way. He said he thought about stealing a Jeep and driving north through China, Siberia, and across the Arctic Circle down through Alaska. Now, I never did learn how he got back. Some may recall at a point in the 1980s, there was an oil slick, a big massive oil slick off the coast, and the oil was coming in onto the shore. It smelled like gasoline, and it, was, uh, it would harden, or somewhat harden into like tar balls, and it got so you literally could not walk on the beach. They had to close the beach out there, and so, I don't think they ever did figure out what caused it. So Jake, to show concern, um, they opted, probably was a Tolbert maneuver, that he was going to fly out from Craigfield off St. John's Bluff, inspect the oil spill, and then fly back to Craigfield on, on St. John's Bluff. And so he had a press conference then when he came back to announce what his findings were from inspecting it. So he told the pilot, he says, now look, nothing fancy, I can get motion sick. Don't worry about it, Mayor, I'll take care of you, no problem. But Jake said he could tell the pilot was kind of excited. So before they took off, they're on the runway, Jake leaned over and turned, and he couldn't, with his back, he kind of had to go like this. He says, now look, no funny business. I got it, Mayor, no problem, no problem, no problem. So they fly out, and this oil, uh, oil spill is just massive out there, and he turned around to come back. And then the pilot said these noted words, Mayor, hang on for this. And he decided to take the mayor on a big loop-de-loop -loop in the plane. <laughs> a complete circle, upside down. And I said, Jake, what happened? He says, well, as soon as he started to pull up, I began yelling and cursing at him. He said, when the plane was upside down, that was the first time I threw up. He says, as it turned straight down, I could see the plane rushing to the ocean, and that was the second time I threw up. 
the pilot leveled off, the stuff was dripping from the ceiling. <laughs> this, this anecdote won't make the six o'clock news, will it? He said the windshield was covered and the pilot's having to use a sleeve to clean it off. And he said he cursed that pilot all the way. They had to fly to JIA, drive him home to change, and then he drove to Craig Field where reporters were all waiting to find out his announcement. The extraordinary aspect I think so many people up here have touched on really, really well. There was something about not just his love for Jacksonville, but um, really he kind of had a feel, he gave off an aura like Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt did t during the Depression, like Ronald Reagan did in the 1980s. He instilled hope. He instilled a positive aspect of the community as it is right now. It was a vibe that's really, really hard to describe. And it was alluded to earlier, he was very protective of Jacksonville. In the 1980s, I went to a roast. I can't remember who was the roastee or what the cause was, and former Governor Claude Kirk spoke. Claude Kirk had lived in Jacksonville, very, very much of a character. His two daughters are still here in town, and when Claude Kirk got up to speak, he had to leave, so they put him on early so he could take off. And uh, he, instead of roasting whoever was the roastee, he just roasted Jacksonville. He talked about how the smell and the downtown was dying and the toll bridges that were all over the place and how backward the town was. He takes off. Then Jake's turn to go up, and he said, I didn't like what that governor had to say one damn bit. He says, it's not funny, it's not true, and I hope his ass is already outside the city limits, <laughs> and that he never comes back. <laughs> now, ironically, um, Governor Kirk came to speak at former Mayor Hans Tanzler's funeral. The family had asked him just a few years back, and I'm sitting next to Jake. All the living mayors were then pallbearers for, for the ceremony. And uh, I sat next to Jake, and, and I knew this, never sit next to Jake at a funeral. He can't hear, he doesn't know how to whisper, and he curses and we're sitting in a church. So I suppose what happened next was really my fault. So I said, Jake, Governor Kirk's up front about to talk. I said, do you remember that roast where Governor Kirk spoke a while back? He says, I damn sure do, and I can't believe that rotten SOB's back in town. <laughs> now, Governor Kirk did a beautiful job at the ceremony, a wonderful job. It was very, very touching talking about Mayor Tanzler, and remember he patted the coffin, and he said, Hans, I'll see you soon. Now often we hear at, at a life celebration like this that, um, that if you're in heaven, you, you never want to leave. It's, it's wonderful it could, as it could be. But I long said about Jake that if he was given the choice to live anywhere in the world, Switzerland, a castle, the Mediterranean Sea, if you paid Jake a million dollars a year to live someplace else, if you gave Jake the choice between Eden or Jacksonville, he'd pick Jacksonville. Now, I don't think any of us can imagine how wonderful heaven is and that no one really, if they're up there, would ever really want to leave. But if Gene weren't already there in heaven, I could see Jake talking to God and saying this, now God, this heaven's a very nice place, but it could use a little improvement, maybe a big river, maybe some more catfish and bass and redfish, Maybe a football team, and I don't care if it wins or loses. God said that losing part's good. And he says, I'd really like to have more people up here from Jacksonville, both the good and the bad. So God, could you please send me back to Jacksonville, hopefully in a Jeep across dry land? We'll see Jake soon. God bless y'all.
light and wide Castles on the Rhine The Parthenon and moments on The River City Line How lovely Oh, it was oh. Thanks for the memory Of rainy afternoons Swinging hollow tunes Of motor trips And burning lips And burning toes And rooms How lovely It was Many's the time We feasted Oh Many's the time we fasted Oh well, it was fun while it lasted We had some fun, no harm done So thanks, oh thanks for the memory of sunburns on the shore Nights in Singapore uh, Might have been a headache But maybe you never were a bore <laughs> How lovely And thank you so much Thanks for the memory of sentimental verse Oh, and nothing in my purse And chuckles when the preacher said For better or for worse How lovely it was Thanks for Tinkling temple bells, alma mater yells of Cuban rum and towels from the very best hotels. How lovely, oh, it was. We said goodbye on a high ball. And I got as high as a steeple But we're intelligent people Yeah No tears, no fuss Hooray for us Thanks for the memory Strictly onto a new Darling, how are you? And how are all the little dreams That never came true? Awfully glad I met you Cheerio and toodaloo And thank you So Good morning. First of all, I think we all owe a great deal of gratitude and debt to Mike Tolbert and his team for putting this on. Mike, Mike never ceases to amaze any of us, and this was his dream and his idea, and congratulations, Mike and your team are the best. Mr. Mayor, former mayors, all of the elected officials, family, and friends. <clears throat> Jay Cobble was a man for all seasons. 
His courage and enthusiasm and vision and compassion was known by all. He was a servant leader and fighter for the people. And he had a great sense of humor. He was really fun. Actually, Rick Catlett and I were laughing in the backstage. One of us or the other were usually in what we call the deep freeze. When he got mad at us, he just put us aside. And then we had to figure out what the other person was trying to do because we didn't know. And it was amazing. But we, uh, we, we got out of it usually. He forgot what, why we were in it most of the time. In January 1979, I walked into his office. He had some notes that I had given him. I was in his press aide. He said, these are terrible notes, they're horrible. You need to be better than that. He said, they were, this was for the annual important home builders dinner. The mayor said, don't you dare quiver those lips, you're in a man's world. And I said, whoa, what did I get myself into? <laughs> Years later, he told me that I never quivered those lips ever again. The good news is that the man's world also turned into a woman's world. The junior league visited him early on and asked him to be the honorary chair of the women's tennis tournament in Amelia Island. He was delighted and was the, one, and was the chair each year until his mayoral duties ended. He forged great friendships with them along with other women's organizations, especially the Hubbard House. Shortly after Mary Jake was elected, you heard from uh, Preston, he was visited by the CEO and current chair and leaders of the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce. Albert Ernest, then chair, told him that he was one of the only people in Mortiga that supported him. He said, you could kiss babies and kick us every day, Mr. Mayor, or we can join you and if you lead, we will follow. And Mayor Jake did, did lead and the Jacksonville Chamber Partnership was absolutely fabulous. He understood that the business community was the most important partnership because, because of the fact that the Chamber helped bring jobs, jobs to his people. The leadership trips were born in 1980 and the mayor went on every one of them, eight of them, and he was a force on every one of these trips. In fact, they gave him a great send off in San Diego saying, we love you, Jake. And this story shows that the one thing Jacob was not, was he never held a grudge. He knew that the polls showed that the citizens did not like our city back in 79. He set out to change the attitude of our citizens and he did. Festivals, cult fever, and all kinds of activities were begun. Partnerships with all people, African Americans, women, men, children. Mayor Jake visited Washington, D.C. frequently, as you heard. Buckman Street sewer plant was overflowing. JEA, JTA, people mover. He loved Washington and they loved him. The Conference of Mayors was a huge part of our administration. And I see Henry Cook out there. He used to go quite a bit with us when he was on the council. The mayor and some staff members attended one of the last dinners held by outgoing President Jimmy Carter in 1981. It was a glorious night at the White House. The next day, he read in the Times Union about the fact that the Jacksonville Symphony was about $10,000 in debt. So he asked Flurry Yelvington and me to co-chair the Symphony Spring Spectacular. And I said, well, what do you want? He said, I want you to bring the White House to Jacksonville. And that's what we did. We had a beautiful, wonderful dinner called the Symphony String Spring Spectacular in 1981 and 82 at the Robert Meyer Hotel. And many of you were there and remember what a beautiful evening it was. He understood that the arts mean business. Then he assisted the Jasper Symphony, the Florida Theater, the Restoration, the Ramses, Jazz Festival, and so on. The senior citizens especially were important to him the mob was begun, the mayor's older buddies. They had a ball with their fish-a-thons and he loved visiting the senior citizen centers. The seniors even got to enjoy the Michael Jackson victory tour in 1986. Many of them were seen by us moonwalking up and down the aisles at the Gator Bowl. What a sight. That just, Jake loved that. Anytime people had a great time, especially the seniors, he loved. So many accomplishments, all done through important partnerships. 
We had a great staff headed up by Don McClure and Betty, Rick, me, Flurry, Denise. There's so many of us that, were, that are here and not here. And it was a fantastic group. I had the privilege to spend a lot of time with the mayor in this past year. He loved his dog, Bo, who you saw. His neighbors, Eric, Chris, Tom, Tim, Susan, Debbie, Clyde, JT Revenaugh, who spent literally until his death at least four times a day in Jake's house. And his friends, Arnie Tritt, Dickie, Sam, Al, Mac, Warren, and many, many more, always calling and visiting. The phone never stopped ringing. They talked about fishing, football, basketball, and politics. All the pol politicians called and they loved him and he loved them. I'm gonna miss really being up to date on the political world. And he was so happy. He had this huge sign in his car, the JEA is ours. And I know that he was so happy before he died, he knew the JEA remained ours. He was so proud of his son, Ben, granddaughters, Morgan and Matilda, and siblings, Charlene, Faye, and Len. We will miss him. However, we know that he is in heaven with his lovely, lovely wife, Jean. I'd also like to thank my Bank of America family, Greg Smith and Melinda, because anytime Jay called, they said go. And I appreciate that. But rest assured, there is no R.I.P., you know how they put those on, resting in peace for him. Oh no, he told Rick Catlett and me many times, all I do is beat those damn drums. And he would tell us in, in lunch and he'd have the thing. And he said, I have to, I have to keep the city enthused. Well, we know what he's doing in heaven. He's beating those damn drums and keep beating them, Mr. Mayor. We love you, we appreciate you and honor you. And Lord, we sent you our best. God bless you, Mr. Mayor. We all had the best of times because of you. fell in love with Jacksonville. get 65,000 people in those seats up there and let them tell Mr. Ursay that they want the Colts here in Jacksonville. They want the Jacksonville Colts.
flowers floated overhead, the mayor gave a speech. We needed a centerpiece, not a corner piece, a centerpiece that we could build from. The uh, membership has selected Jacksonville as the 30th NFL club. Holy sh! We got it. When we got the announcement, Jake broke down and wept because he was the visionary who saw it through, saw it come through. You know, when you leave this world, you want to make it better. When I leave Jacksonville, I wanted to just say, hey, he made it a better place. He added a lot to the to quality of life. Would you all stand, please, and remain at your seats while the family files out? And could we have an encore of the Battle Hymn of the Republic? Are you going to sing? I'm, I'm going to save you from me singing. God bless you. Thank you all for coming, and God bless every single one of you.